day for us because we have our College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario inspection tomorrow. Happy to be with you guys tonight. And uh, we are ready to go for tomorrow and hopefully we'll pass with uh, flying colors, of course, and have a great topic tonight, uh, something we get asked about all the time. And so this is a really good opportunity to review guidelines with you guys about how to manage unexplained infertility. Uh, there are a lot of people getting a lot of different treatments out there and a lot of different advice, try this, try that, even from their physicians. And sometimes that advice makes sense. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, it actually doesn't make sense. So I thought I'd review the most recent guidelines with you guys, go over them, talk about them in detail, and uh, um, talk about the limits and the you know parts of even these guidelines that require a sort of careful evaluation. Um, but this is from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, which is sort of one of the world's largest groups for guiding or sort of explaining and um, setting the standards for what we do for fertility care in almost every regard of fertility care. And just for those of you that are interested, uh, this is readily available to all of you for free online. You can get it at uh, www.asrm, that's American Society of Reproductive Medicine, .org, .org. And if you go to their practice bulletins, it's about um, a few months old. I think it came out, let's see if I can find the exact date for you guys. It was uh, February of 2020, so uh, a few months old now. Um, and uh, we were doing individual little studies, but I thought it's time to kind of come out with a full review of this because uh, we get it asked on almost every show. Someone says they tried this, they tried that, and I'm sitting there scratching my head going, why did they try that? None of that stuff works. So um, this would be a better opportunity to uh, to kind of clarify everything for you guys, explain it all, make sure you understood what was going on. Hi to those of you that are saying hi as you sign on. Lots of our Instagram friends are joining us. Um, we are happy to... Uh, uh, have you join us from any of the other platforms too. We do stream on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Instagram at the same time. And if you see my eyes kind of shifting up and down, it's because Instagram uh, won't play nice with the other services. And so um, we have to be on one camera for Instagram and on another camera for all the other services. So uh, that's why we kind of float up and down. So hopefully you guys have all been staying well. Um, I am trusting that you guys are all very clearly aware, aware that we are kind of facing a bit of a second wave with the virus, and a lot of people are panicked about a shutdown of fertility services. Um, at present, there is no indication whatsoever that we're going to shut down any of the fertility services. No one's asked to do that, and a Canadian-wide um, uh, statement kind of went out recently indicating, uh, or I guess asking actually, um, you know, if we should update things and what we would do, but there has been no suggestion of another shutdown. So hopefully we will avoid that. So lots of uh, uh, hearts and, uh, you know, thanks to all those involved in that process. Let's uh, all very carefully um, observe uh, social distancing, make sure you're washing your hands still, make sure you're wearing a mask as often as possible. Um, and don't break the rules because the rules are there to protect all of us, not just you, um, but everybody around you as well. So uh, make sure you stick with that, especially with the little ones back in school. Um, there are studies that show that children have the ability to infect 25% of their household contacts, even when the child is asymptomatic. So it is hugely important for you guys to uh, very carefully and clearly make sure that you are not um, avoiding the things that are important in terms of protecting yourself. So mask all the time, hand washing all the time. Do not go out and party with a bunch of people. Uh, that's probably very detrimental to your overall well-being and to the well-being of many other people um, in your circle. Okay, so uh, the topic today is evidence-based treatments for couples with unexplained infertility, a guideline. So this is from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And uh, these guys are great. They basically assemble the best of the world's experts. They put everybody together. They task them with coming up with a guideline that will explain what 
uh, you know, a specific topic is. It could be IVF, it could be male factor IVF, it could be genetic testing, PGT, mosaicism. And if you go through there, you'll see tons and tons of info on many different subjects, all of which I had to memorize last year for the big board exam. So um, it's a, a great resource. It's free. You can access it without even being a, a member. And uh, they're readily available to you to look at and peruse. And um, some of it's pretty scientific, so you probably need some help getting through some bits. But they have these really nice summary statements. And what we're going to do tonight, um, for those of you on Facebook or um, on uh, Twitter or YouTube, um, you're in the right place if you're on one of those ones because I can share everything with you guys. And that way we can kind of go over it all together. So you should be seeing that now. Um, and I'm going to start by just telling you what studies they included. For those of you on Instagram, um, we love you guys too. I do love Instagram. Um, but unfortunately, I can't show you everything. So you have to uh, listen to me read uh, briefly. So uh, they included randomized controlled trials or systematic reviews or meta-analyses or even other trials that at least had one comparison group. So um, that could be a cohort, a case control, um, a trial without randomization, anything like that. They made sure everybody was human, so there were no animal studies because it's kind of hard to have unexplained infertility in animals. They made sure they were all English which does eliminate some valuable research, in particular in French, um, German, things like that, where we do get some literature, but uh, the majority, these ones were all English. Um, the studies had to have a comparison group. Um, they did allow early endometriosis or minimal endometriosis, so that's important as well for those of you that may have that. Um, if there was ICSI involved, they made sure that there was at least a minimum sperm count. And they did make sure that these women were having regular ovulation. So this is not in relation to polycystic ovarian syndrome. That's really important to remember because we're going to talk about meds we use for polycystic ovarian syndrome that we know work in that situation, but do not work for, um, for the patients with unexplained infertility. And then they also looked at uh, pregnancy rates, live birth rates. So the studies had to have that as a primary or secondary outcome. And then uh, they looked at studies that had uh, gonadotropins, which are the injectable meds. There is a whole slew of things that they excluded. So steroid therapy, diagnostic rather than therapeutic studies. Um, if they were testing your tubes, as part of the actual study, if acupuncture was part of the treatment, if you were getting tamoxifen, um, if there was progesterone support. So there's some stuff that they excluded, uh, including things like tubal factors, severe male factors. So there were some things in there that were really important uh, that they excluded, and that was appropriate for this study because those people probably don't have unexplained infertility. So then they categorized their recommendations based on things like high quality evidence, intermediate quality evidence, and low. And then they had grade A, B, uh, and C in terms of the strength of the evidence as well. Okay, so I actually asked on, on our Instagram account uh, a couple of questions like, uh, you know, how many people think that unexplained IUI uh, helps? And initially it was like 60% um, uh, thought that IUI would help for unexplained infertility when it was just being used alone. And I also asked how many people had had letrozole uh, for unexplained infertility alone. And uh, again, initially it was about 62%. I think we ended up around 55% or so that had in both categories or both questions that had said that yes, they had had letrozole and or yes, they believe that IUI alone without any medication was helpful for unexplained infertility. So this is really important because you guys are out there all the time, you're reading, you're learning, uh, you're talking to your friends, you're in your chat groups, all of that stuff, and that's really important. Uh, but at the same time, there is a lot of misinformation out there, um, even from the physicians. And I know lots of physicians that have given patients medications uh, that don't necessarily work. So that's what I wanted to review with you guys. So the first topic is, does intrauterine insemination work with your natural cycle? So this is you just making your natural egg. Usually you'll produce one every month. If you're making your one egg and it's growing and releasing, is insemination alone going to be helpful? So they looked at seven different randomized controlled trials, one cost-effectiveness study, six cohort studies, 
and looked at the answer to this. And the answer is no, insemination on its own is useless. So if you look down here, you'll see their summary statement. Their summary statement for those of you on Instagram says, there is strong evidence that IUI in unstimulated cycles, so your natural egg, is less effective than ovarian stimulation with IUI, and it is not significantly more effective than expected management. So expected management gets you somewhere between 3.1 to 4.3% success, and doing IUI alone does not alter that. You're still in that same success range. So you're spending money, you're going through the emotional part of it, you gotta go into the clinic, some places bring you in and, and test you and do all sorts of ovulation testing and so on, um, and looking with blood work and ultrasounds, and at the end of the day, they're not actually helping you. You're spending valuable money for nothing. So if you have unexplained infertility, should you be doing just IUI without any pills? No, you should not. Now, if you have cervical factor, or you've got male factor, those are all different issues. But if you don't have any of those, you're purely unexplained. They've explored you for everything. They can't find a reason. Do not do just IUI. It will not work. And so their recommendation is, it is not recommended to perform IUI in natural cycles for the treatment of unexplained infertility. It's less effective than taking stimulation with IUI and no more effective than just waiting and having sex. So you could do that for free. So the next question is, what about clomid, clomiphene citrate? So for those of you in Canada, it's hard to get clomid. You have to have it custom compounded now. I believe it's still available in the US, which makes it a little easier to get. Um, for a lot of us, it was supplanted by letrozole because we use these drugs mainly in our PCOS population. And letrozole is actually better than Clomid in the PCO population. So we often use letrozole more now. But uh, for this particular part of the study, they just looked at the Clomid. So, this one included four randomized controlled trials, three systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials, uh, and they all, again, showed the exact same thing, which is there is good evidence that clomiphene citrate with timed intercourse, so this is just clomid, you're not having an IUI, is no more effective than expectant management. So they said it is not more effective and therefore it is not recommended. So I see this all the time. You've gone to your family doc, you have not done adequate testing probably, or even if they have done adequate testing, they say, you know what, here, take some Clomid for a little while. And then people try it and they come in saying, well, I took Clomid, why didn't it work? Well, the reason is if you have unexplained infertility, it's not gonna work. It's no better than expecting. That doesn't mean you can't get pregnant during that time period. You may well get pregnant, 3.1 to 4.3% do, but it has nothing to do with the Clomid, it's just pure luck. So the next one is the aromatase inhibitors, which is letrozole, so we were just talking about that. Same thing here. There is good evidence that letrozole with timed intercourse is no more effective than clomiphene citrate with timed intercourse, which is not effective, or expectant management. So again, if you're taking the oral medications, clomid or letrozole, and that's the only thing you're doing, you're not doing it with insemination, you're actually not doing anything of any value. So that does not help you at all. It is not useful and you're not going anywhere, so you're spending money on meds, which do have some side effects, granted not a lot, but it's not doing anything for you. So the next grouping is, well, what about the shots? The shots are stronger, right? Everybody says, yeah, the shots are stronger. I'm spending all this money, this has gotta be good. Well, it gets a little bit more dicey here. So the problem with the shots is they've included four randomized trials, one systematic review, and three cohort studies to see if it worked or not. And the answer from all of this was, if you're just taking the shots and having sex, you're not doing insemination. They say that there's insufficient evidence to determine if it's beneficial or not. But they say that there's moderate evidence that the treatment outcomes, pregnancy rates, miscarriage rates, and so on, are essentially similar to what you get from just taking the oral medications with timed intercourse. So that's, again, not helpful because we just reviewed that. And they said most studies report no difference in pregnancy outcomes if you're taking gonadotropins, the shots, versus just taking the pills with a slightly higher rate within that same pregnancy rate of having twins or triplets. 
So that's a problem because if we are going to get you pregnant, we really are trying very hard to get you pregnant with just one baby at a time because it's much, much safer for you guys. So again, the recommendation, not recommended to use shots with timed intercourse. I don't think I've ever done that before. Um, in the treatment of unexplained, studies report either no difference in pregnancy outcomes compared with oral stimulation agents or higher pregnancy rates associated with a higher risk of multiple gestations. So dangerous in some extent and probably not beneficial. Okay, well, clomid alone, letrozole alone, shots alone doesn't work. IUI alone doesn't work. Well, what if we combine those things? What if we do pills with shot or with insemination? Does that help? So it does. If you look at ovarian stimulation with Clomid and you're doing insemination with that, if I can get this computer to cooperate, here we go. So summary statement for that, and there's lots of studies of this, okay? There is strong evidence. So this, these are lots of good studies behind this that Clomid with IUI is superior to expectant management and natural cycle IUI for the outcome of live birth. So the holy grail I always talk about is the live birth rate. Live birth rate is higher with Clomid and IUI versus just expectant management or just taking IUI or just taking Clomid. Multiple gestation pregnancy rates with Clomiphene citrate and IUI range from zero to 12.5%. We normally quote eight. Um, and there are very little differences overall in terms of the outcomes. Um, there were huge numbers of studies involved in this. They did also compare between letrozole and IUI versus Clomid and IUI. They basically said that there were no significant differences, although they said maybe there's a little bit of a higher success rate with letrozole and IUI than with Clomid and IUI. So bottom line is, Good, strong evidence that if you combine the two, now you're seeing a higher success rate. What kind of success rates are we talking about? Over six months of use, anywhere from like lows of, you know, obviously zero if it wasn't working to as high as about a cumulative rate of 30%. Um, so you got to be prepared for the fact that this is not a guarantee. Uh, there are lots of people that still need further therapy, but at least you have a better chance um, starting off. Um, and in one or two studies, the rates were getting as high as like 40, 45%. So reasonable to try this, um, reasonably cost effective as well, uh, no harm done. And so it's, it's completely reasonable to do this. So what about letrozole with IUI? They did study it separately. They also say here there's strong evidence that there is no significant difference in pregnancy rates or multiple gestation pregnancy rate following letrozole with IUI as compared to Clomid and IUI. So we know Clomid and IUI is good and it does work. On average per cycle, you're gonna get around an 8% success. So with letrozole and IUI, it's the same outcome in terms of success rate. It's the same outcome in terms of twins. Um, I've never seen triplets on letrozole. I'm sure somebody has. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Okay, uh, what about IUI with combinations of Clomid and the shots or letrozole and the shots, right? So does that help you? Maybe you need that extra little bit of push. So it is a higher success rate. So they say there is fair evidence that clomiphene citrate and the conventional dose, so normal dose gonadotropin with IUI, so you're taking Clomid, you're taking the shots, and you're doing an insemination, have higher pregnancy rates than expectant management. They say that there is good evidence that that combination is increasing your risk of multiples, and there is actually good evidence that the clinical pregnancy rate and live birth rate are actually similar when comparing letrozole and low-dose gonadotropins with IUI versus clomiphene citrate and low-dose gonadotropins. So if you try and take letrozole versus Clomid with the shots and IUI, you're going to get the same outcome. So they say that you don't really need to do it because you're not getting a much better success rate than you are with just Clomid or letrozole, but you are increasing the risk of multiple gestation. Now, here's one place where it's a little confusing because they do say that the success rate of getting pregnant is higher, but they're kind of putting a downplay on it because they don't want you to get pregnant with multiples, which is also higher. So um, you gotta take this with a grain of salt. If you need that extra push because you've been trying for a long time, this is a reasonable approach. You just have to be prepared for the fact that you may end up with more than one little critter inside there. 
What about IUI with just low dose shots? So that's up at the top here on the page. So if you're taking a low dose, which traditionally is less than 150 units a day of Puragon or Gonalef or Menopur, whatever your drug of choice is for your clinic and your physician. So um, they've got lots of studies on this as well. And the summary statement, again, insufficient evidence that treatment with low dose gonadotropins with IUI gives you a higher pregnancy rate than the Clomid or the Letrozole. So you're taking shots, which is uncomfortable for sure. You're getting way more hassle. You definitely need monitoring. You can't take shots without getting ultrasounds and blood tests. And actually, it does not show a significant difference in outcomes. However, they do say that the cancellation protocols, the study populations may be responsible for why they're seeing not a huge difference. There may actually be a difference there, but because they were so strict about who they would cancel, like for example, more than two or three eggs at a time, um, you weren't getting as much of a difference. So they said if, you're, if your outcome prognosis is good or inter intermediate, um, you should uh, skip the low dose because over six months, it was the same as expectant management. I'm not quite sure how you're supposed to figure out if their prognosis is good when they've got unexplained infertility. No one really explains that in this study. What about conventional dose gonadotropins? This is taking more than 150. Um, I'm not quite sure who would do that. You've gotta be either older or a bit heavier in order to justify a higher dose of gonadotropins than 150. We typically don't even go up to 150 for our IUIs unless your ovaries are weak, you have diminished ovarian reserve, um, your body mass index is elevated, you've had previous failures, uh, that kind of thing. Um, or age is a factor. So if you're, you know, 37, 38, 39, uh, you can afford to have three or four eggs at that point because the chances of twins and triplets is lower and your success rate, you know, needs to be a little bit higher as well. So all those are kind of critical elements to, to factor in, right? So what did they say for this one? Same thing, insufficient evidence that this is a higher pregnancy rate than just taking the oral meds with IUI. So in other words, you're spending all that money on higher dose shots now, even more money than you were with the lower dose ones. And they're saying that it may not be beneficial. Again, they put in that, you know, sort of disclaimer where they say it may be because of different study types and different investigation questions and different patient populations and cancellation criteria. So again, I do suspect it is stronger and there are studies that have shown that it's stronger. Um, and that your results are going to be a higher success rate, but they're worried because nobody wants you to have twins and triplets, and it is uncontrolled when you're doing IUI. Okay, what about the timing of the intrauterine insemination? Some people do zero hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, and then there's that whole pool of, should we do a double IUI? And the answer is, if you're doing it, Anytime between 0 to 36 hours, it's the same, although there is one study that says that 36 is better than 24. So we traditionally choose 36 and most places do. Um, there is good evidence that a single IUI is the same as a double IUI. The only time it may be beneficial is if you have very low sperm count, so then maybe a double IUI would be better. Um, and they actually go so far as to say, and we've explained this on the show before, that monitoring when you're just taking something like Clomid and doing IUI or Letrozole and IUI, doing the LH monitoring or ultrasound monitoring is not necessary. Um, there's no evidence that shows that that improves anything in terms of timing compared to just using an LH kit. So you can send these patients home, wait for the natural surge, take a trigger shot to improve your success rate, and then go ahead and do your IUI 36 hours later or 24 hours later in those cases, which is what we do. Um, and you'll get a very good success rate with that. Okay, what about IVF? Well, IVF is definitely the best treatment for unexplained infertility as it is for almost everything. However, they say current evidence does not support IVF as a first line therapy. So you do not need to jump into this, which is what a lot of places are doing. So you show up, you say, wow, we, we're trying everything. They go, okay, let's investigate you. They investigate you, they say, look, you've got unexplained infertility, you should do IVF. Well, actually, you don't need to do IVF because you've got a, you know, as high as 30, maybe even 40% chance doing the pills, super simple with IUI, super simple, 
way more cost effective. And if we don't have to do IVF on you, legitimately the only reason to do it in that scenario is to make money. And that's not the right you know, reason. That's totally immoral as far as I'm concerned. So really you don't need that as your first line therapy. I strongly support this statement. Should it be used in older women? Yes, if your ovaries are getting weaker, that's a different story because using up six months of time for something with a lower success rate is very different from younger women with unexplained infertility. And they say that here as well, good evidence that in immediate IVF in women greater than or equal to 38 years of age may be associated with a higher pregnancy rate and shorter time to pregnancy compared to a strategy consisting of uh, the oral medications for stimulation with the IUI treatments or even taking the shots um, with IUI treatments. So make sure that you factor in everything about you. If your ovaries are weaker, if your age is an important issue, you got to put that into the equation before you decide what to do. So that's really important too. So um, that's the whole total of the things that they looked at. Now, the one thing they didn't look at is surgery. We do talk about that a lot on the show. Um, it is one of the alternative options. And if you have unexplained infertility and it wasn't in the day and age of COVID, it would be very reasonable and rational to consider doing uh, something surgical to evaluate to see if you potentially have endometriosis. Because if you do have endometriosis, that definitely makes it a lot harder to get pregnant. And those patients really need extra care, extra evaluation, possibly extra treatments, because you're no longer unexplained. You've got tubal damage, you've got scarring, you've got inflammation, you've got hormonal changes, um, inflammatory changes, and all of those things can be contributing to your infertility. So knowing if you have endo, tubal damage, scarring, anything like that can be a huge issue moving forward through all of these uh, um, you know, important, important decisions that you make. So I do believe in surgery for unexplained infertility. Um, there is some data that demonstrates that it is helpful. And certainly if you have mild or moderate endo treating, it does improve your success. Um, so we've had loads of that where I operate on patients, find out they have endo, you clear up the endo, uh, and they get pregnant without needing any therapy. So that's a really good option for patients too. Problem right now, at least in Canada, it's virtually impossible to get you into an operating room. So you're kind of back to square one. So uh, we didn't really totally have a fact or fiction this week because there are so many different topics, but the fact and the fictions are that if you're taking either Clomid alone, Letrozole alone, IUI alone, or shots alone, there is no benefit over just trying by yourselves without any kind of therapy. It's not until you start combining the pills with IUI, the pills and shots with IUI, shots with IUI or IVF or surgery, that you're actually doing something productive for unexplained infertility. So make sure if you do actually have a diagnosis of unexplained infertility, and that really needs to be determined by an REI, a fertility specialist, that you're not just getting pills and going home. It's not gonna work, guys. And if you're trying to save money, you're actually wasting time by avoiding the IUI, which is a necessary component of your success. Okay, so thanks for joining us for that portion of the show. As always, uh, like, comment, subscribe on the YouTube channel. We wanna get people to view this. This is a really important topic and hopefully lots of people will pay attention to it so that they're saving themselves time, money, stress, a lot of uh, expended effort for nothing in many, many cases. Uh, and we're gonna start taking your questions now. So um, let me see what we've got. If you've been on letrozole and it has not been successful, would Clomid be an alternative in these situations? So it can be if you're PCO, but not if it's unexplained and you're not doing the IUI like we just said. So Clomid or, um, or the, uh, the uh, letrozole can be very useful, but only when it's being used with IUI. And yes, we do switch for some people if we've tried one and they don't want to jump into doing shots, we will try the, uh, the other oral medication first. So it's a reasonable approach. Uh, Nicola, just want to say you are amazing. Thank you for helping us bring our daughter into the world this morning. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me be part of that. That was a, an exciting time and I'm glad you're doing well. So um, uh, thanks for letting me be part of that. 
Can everyone please pray to God? I've been taking letrozole 2.5 milligrams three times a day for five days this time around. It finally worked for me. We find out on Friday if we are expecting. Oh, yay. Awesome. So uh, everybody say a prayer. Um, that's for Emily. So um, we've got our, uh, our prayers going for you. Um, lots of thumbs up and likes for Emily. Uh, and M, some people are responding by wishing you good luck. Uh, let me see what they asked us on Instagram, too. It's always going back and forth here a little bit. So, um, what is the best antidepressant to be on in terms of not affecting male fertility? Uh, no antidepressant is the best antidepressant to be on. Um, but if you have to take one, you definitely want one that is milder, so like a Ciprolex is reasonable. Most of the SSRIs are probably all okay, but try and avoid um, anything like a tricyclic antidepressant. Um, you want to be on something pretty mild. Uh, there isn't really a huge difference. You just can't be on antipsychotics. They raise your prolactin levels that has hormonal impact. But ideally be on nothing. Would you consider allergies to dust and pollen as a reason to consider immune issues for implantation? Uh, do you prescribe prednisolone for your patients? And if so, for what indications? So all our patients go on steroids prior to their embryo transfer. Um, so if we're doing embryo, <coughs> excuse me, transfers, yep, we use steroids. Um, sometimes for patients where we are concerned about an immune problem, we'll keep them on a low dose of steroids. And if you have really bad allergies, you should be on some kind of immune therapy because that will help you. Um, so yeah, I'm a believe in that. I have no problems putting people on steroids. Um, the indications for us, it's universal for the five days leading up to embryo transfer. Beyond that, if you do have an overactive immune system, multiple implantation failures, or you've done the immune system testing, which is just psychotically expensive, but available, uh, then that's a reasonable indication to do that as well. Uh, for male low motility and count, without an underlying reason, what is the number one way to increase motility and count? Oh, that's easy. Uh, make sure he's healthy. So low weight, if guys are heavy, that's a reason. Uh, make sure he's not wearing anything tight. Keep laptops away from your lap. Uh, no cell phones near your pelvis. Um, make sure they're exercising, very healthy diet. So Mediterranean diet, low in carbs, low in fat. Uh, you got to make sure that you're not getting excessively hot. Stay out of hot tub saunas. Uh, make sure you're ejaculating every two days. Tons and tons of antioxidants, especially the vitamins, green tea. Uh, all of those types of things will be beneficial. And um, those are the main ways to do it. Uh, you can always use insemination to facilitate it for you as well. Uh, but those are the best options. And then depending on your hormone status, you're saying no reason was found, but sometimes people don't look for the right reason. So if the hormone status is part of it as well, you can take medications that will stimulate your sperm production. So check that out as well. One more Graham question. Is letrozole helpful in recurrent miscarriages? Uh, some people argue it is. So uh, there's even some data which we reviewed on the show months ago now, eight, nine months ago, showing that uh, letrozole prior to embryo transfer is actually beneficial. So uh, there is some data suggesting it is helpful. And so it's a reasonable thing to consider if you're fighting recurrent miscarriages. And sorry if you are, I know that's very difficult to go through. Um, we are starting a new round of egg retrieval, how to improve egg quality and sperm quality. So sperm quality, we just talked about. So that's pretty easy. Egg quality is really tough to improve because you're kind of born with everything you're gonna have. So it's tough to improve, but again, stay away from everything bad. And I should have mentioned that for the guys, no smoking, no drinking, no drug use whatsoever at all. Same thing for the ladies, lots of vitamins, get your weight into an appropriate range, Avoid the high sugar, high cholesterol uh, traps, um, you know, no environmental toxins, that kind of thing. Those are all really important. Most of you have seen me kind of take a sip while we're on the show because my throat will run dry talking for an hour. This is green tea. I don't know if you guys can see it. I'm probably going to dump it all over the desk here, but uh, it's green tea. That's all I drink. I'm always having green tea. 
And this one is some sort of special vitamin infused uh, green tea from Tetley. It actually tastes really good. It's like a fruity green tea. Uh, okay. Um, unexplained infertility is so hard. Yes, it is. Just have to trust the process and hope for the best outcome. Hugs to all that are struggling with this journey. You're not alone. Tina, we love you. I know who you are. Uh, do I have to wait for my husband's DNA fragmentation results to come in before we try IUI? How long does it usually take to get the results? You don't have to wait. Um, we tend to use the Zymo uh, device to screen out the sperm with high DNA fragmentation. And it usually doesn't take us more than about two weeks to get the results because we batch them, batch the test and run it together. So uh, usually a week or two after that, we'll give you a buzz and go over the results with you. Uh, having said that, if you want to go straight to doing the Zymo, that's the best we've got, aside from the lifestyle choices we just talked about for the men. So as long as you're doing those lifestyle choices, he's on the antioxidants, he's taking the vitamins, there's no reason why you can't go ahead and try on your own um, or with IUI with us. Uh, so that's a reasonable thing to do. Just make sure you ask for the Zymo. Because if you do have high DNA fragmentation and we don't use the Zymo, you're not screening those out. And it does impact things like success and miscarriage rates. Um, oh, that's not showing up. Sorry. Um, Thank you. Is seraphine still a treatment used? Seraphine and Clomid are the exact same medication. It's just made by different companies. So Clomiphene and seraphine are identical. Uh, it is still used, um, but the company that made seraphine, which was Serono, uh, stopped producing it. So we can't get it anymore. So we have to have it custom compounded. But it's the same drug. Uh, thank you for tonight's show. How many IUIs are recommended before moving on to IVF? It depends. We would normally say three with oral meds, three with shots, and then for sure IVF. But some people, if they jump straight into the shots and IUI, should move right to IVF. And that's a very reasonable thing to consider doing. A uh, good question. Uh, back to Instagram. My lining thickness was 0 0.77 at cycle day 10 or so. But when it was measured again at cycle day 12, it was 0 0.6. Yeah. Can it shrink or was it a measuring error? Uh, it can shrink. Um, we don't always know why, but it can shrink. We've had that happen to us as well. Uh, that's obviously a problem and concerning for all of us. Uh, the thing to remember with that is you got to make sure your progesterone level didn't go up. You got to make sure you're taking your estrogen the right way. Um, again, make sure your stress level is not too high. Acupuncture, aspirin, Viagra, um, there are vitamin D, C, uh, E, all of those can help increase your lining thickness. So those are important things to consider. And many of those can actually help improve your lining. So that's something you should uh, probably explore. Um, aspirin, if I didn't mention a second ago. Uh, so all of those are very reasonable, um, even without bleeding or spotting. The other thing is your lining does contract. In many women, the uterus will contract. And when it contracts, it's contracting in three dimensions. But when you watch it on the screen, you'll see it literally squeeze because it's actually like a wave. But as the wave goes through, it kind of shrinks everything when it goes down like that. So as it's going down, everything gets compressed. And if they measure you when you're shrunken versus where it's fully expanded, it actually can make several millimeters of difference. And, and that's important too. So make sure they check that out. Hello, Dr. V. Uh, hello. What is your opinion on ovulation pain? I have had all my test surgery with you and no known case of PCOS, but I often get pain in my ovaries, specifically my right side. Uh, so ovulation pain is common. It's called middle schmerz, which is a German for pain in the middle because it's in the middle of your cycle usually. And uh, it has no bearing on PCOS. In fact, if anything, women with PCOS don't ovulate very often. So it's got nothing to do with pain. Um, sometimes it can be associated with endometriosis, but for those who we've already done surgery on, such as yourself, uh, that's not the case if we couldn't find it there. There are just some women whose ovaries are more sensitive and they get pain. It is not associated with a better or a worse outcome. It's still the same for you. So hopefully that uh, sets your mind at ease. What could that pain ache be a symptom of, in your opinion? Nothing, as I just mentioned. Um, it's not a symptom of anything. Your ovaries are just more sensitive than others. 
Which one of the IUI procedures would you recommend to start with for male factor infertility? Uh, it depends on how severe it is. Um, so the pills like either letrozole or Clomid with IUI would be reasonable. If the DNA fragmentation is high, definitely do the Zymo. Um, having said that, if the male factor is very significant, you may need to consider not doing IUI at all. Sometimes they need IVF. Uh, your other alternative is to try the shots. If the male factor is quite significant, then the shots will boost your chances, as we discussed earlier, um, especially compared to uh, the unexplained. This is not unexplained anymore. You've got male factor. The shots are stronger. So if you're willing to take that small risk of multiples, um, then you may want to consider doing the shots for the guys with very significant male factor. One more IUI. Um, what day of the cycle is the best to start taking letrozole? Uh, day three to seven is the standard. Um, there are some people that do five to nine, like we used to with Clomid, but the original study by Mitt Wally and Casper from way, way back uh, was a study that showed that letrozole was effective from day three to seven. So that's what we normally do. Uh, we have tried, whoops, let's go back. We have tried letrozole with timed intercourse. We tried four cycles of IUI with letrozole and trigger shot. And we recently did IVF with 225 of bone left and 150 of menopure. Eight days of stimulation. Okay, that's very short. Uh, we had six days of six eggs retrieved, all six fertilized, only two made it to day three with good and fair rating, no success. How can we improve our chances? I'm 36, my spouse is 40. So I would need to know more details, but eight days of stimulation has been proven to be too short. Your egg quality is compromised when you're only stimulating for eight days. Um, you would need to check the rest of your history. Again, smoking, drinking, drug use, your weight, his weight, um, what your ovarian function is like, all of those are very important. How did they prepare the sperm? How good was the lab? All of these things are really critical to examine and evaluate and make a, a huge difference to your success rate. So um, reach out to us. We'd be happy to do a consult for you. I can walk you through this. Um, I had something very similar, but a little bit the opposite at the same time. I just recently had a, an hour long conversation with a, a very good friend of a physician who called me personally and said, hey, can you help her out? Uh, she had done uh, not one, but two cycles at a very prominent clinic in the Toronto area where they let her run for 13 or 14 days. When you're going for 13 to 14 days of stimulation, your egg quality is terrible. So that is not a logical thing to do. You should not be going that long. Um, we reviewed that as well on the show not too long ago. Uh, but what was that, a month or two ago, I think we did that one. So. If you're going a long time, then your egg quality is being compromised and your success rates do go down. And um, that's very, very clear. So don't let them drag out the cycle and don't let them make it too short. You gotta be careful with this stuff. A month after miscarriage in early pregnancy, how likely is it that a positive pregnancy test is a new pregnancy and not any leftover HCG? Um, that's a tough one to answer, Adriana. Uh, so it's very simple to tell you if I get 48 hours, because if the beta is going up, like you get one test and then 48 hours get another one, then it is virtually impossible, not impossible, but virtually impossible with the old pregnancy. Um, almost always it'll be a new one. It is unusual to get pregnant that quickly, but it can happen. In the event that your beta is not going up, then you know it was left over from the last one uh, or another failed pregnancy, but again, super unlikely that early. So if it's going up, you're probably in good shape. Uh, back to Instagram. Should you be on letrozole if you're not doing IUI? Uh, depends. If you're on letrozole and you're not doing IUI, but your diagnosis is PCOS, yes, you should be on letrozole. You don't need IUI for PCOS. But if your diagnosis is unexplained, absolutely not. Because as we just reviewed earlier, uh, the guidelines themselves reviewing tons and tons of high quality evidence, uh, and that's a strong recommendation, says it doesn't work. So if you're not doing IUI, you're just taking lectures on your unexplained, you will not be successful. When taking uh, progesterone, if you miss a dose, is it best to double up? No. 
or just miss that dose, just miss the dose. Don't double up because it'll really screw up your physiology. And if you overshoot your progesterone, it can affect the lining um, in terms of its synchronicity with your embryo. You don't want to do that. So please uh, just leave that dose. What are some courses of treatment with one blocked fallopian tube? Uh, well, if you have one block tube, you can still get pregnant as long as the other one's open and functional. So that's not a big deal. Um, but your options would be the same as anybody with infertility. So uh, you can take pills to make more eggs. You can do pills and shots. You can do shots alone. You can add any of those with insemination or even just do insemination. Or you can do IVF, which if your tube is genuinely blocked from a problem, previous damage, previous infection, chlamydia, gonorrhea, endo, um, IVF is definitely your best choice. There are some people that can surgically correct your tubes. Um, it is difficult. It's very, very difficult, and it rarely works. Um, I've done that kind of surgery many times. It's extremely, extremely difficult to get the tube to heal properly. It very rarely does. The damage from infection or endo can be quite severe and really uh, impact our ability to, uh, to be successful for you. But you really have everything open to you if it's just one tube that's blocked and the other tube is functional. So that's the important question. And sometimes you need surgery to figure that out. Is it possible to request surgery to check for endo even if your doctor doesn't suggest it or want to do it? Yeah, of course it is. I mean, I, I, I'm firmly of the belief that patients should be in control. So when I talk to you guys as my clients, I always say, look, you can do A, B, C, or D. Uh, we want you to very much feel like you're in control. So I'm gonna provide you with the information you need. I'm gonna tell you what's wrong. I'm gonna give you all your options but it's for you guys to decide what you want to do. It's not for us to tell you what to do. Uh, it's much more important that you guys decide what to do so that you know what's important for you and you can figure out the best option for you as an individual or you as a couple. And that's really not our place to impose what we think is right for you on you guys. It's for you to decide that stuff. So yes, you can ask for surgery. There's nothing wrong with asking for that. Now, granted, your surgeon also has the right to refuse to do it, and many fertility centers do refuse because it's a delay, it's risky. In uh, a lot of instances, in particular in the US, the fertility doctor doesn't do the surgery, so now they're losing you to someone else and they see that as lost revenue and so they're trying to push you through the machine, uh, the fertility grinder as I like to call it, and um, that's unnecessary. Like I said, we have loads of patients that are successful with just surgery. I, I have a patient I just saw yesterday I came in for because she had some spotting. Um, so I, I met her uh, as a special favor to do an ultrasound on the weekend. Um, and I hope you're doing well uh, if you're watching. So uh, she had uh, years of infertility. She came to see me very clearly sounded like she had endo. I took her to the operating room before we tried anything, did find endo, cleaned it up. Uh, she got pregnant, unfortunately suffered a miscarriage, got pregnant again, and she's currently pregnant and uh, hopefully doing fine. So uh, baby looked happy and healthy yesterday. So there's nothing wrong with doing surgery. Sometimes it avoids the patient having to do anything else. And there's no reason not to explore that with patients that can benefit them a lot. Why wouldn't you do something that's helpful? Uh, you suggested looking into IV, IG, or intralipids for recurrent pregnancy loss which from what I understand would decrease your NK cells. Is it safe to decrease my NK cells during a pandemic? That's a good question. Um, it probably is. Uh, this isn't like an on off switch, it's a decrease. And uh, at the same time, I don't think there's anyone that's gonna be able to formally answer that question for you. So you are taking maybe some risk. I would really think it's minimal. Um, even in non-pandemic times, we never tell anyone that they need to worry when they're taking intralipids or IVIG. So I think you'd probably be safe, and I would uh, not hesitate if you need it. Um, you do need to get uh, exploration of tests and so on to decide if that's a reasonable thing for you. Um, or reach out to a reproductive immunologist. I work with several, and they're all amazing. Um, Follow-up question from Facebook. Uh, how long do I carry on with intralipids for? Uh, right through to 34 weeks, once every six weeks through the pregnancy. Um, so that's a reasonable uh, thing to continue doing. I am 44. 
Hi, have one natural live birth, congrats. My doc does Clomid only with IVF. He says Clomid is better because shots mess up the quality of eggs at my age. Uh, how uh, should I do high dose shots or what do you think? Um, so what your doctor is saying is simply not true, unfortunately. There's absolutely no evidence that Clomid with IVF is better or worse than shots with IVF. Um, there is good data that shows that the more eggs you produce, the higher your chances are. And at 44, it is very difficult to achieve success with IVF. Typically, success rates are single digits or right around the single digit mark. So 7%, 8%, maybe 10 or 11%. Um, and so you've got to be really careful doing IVF at all. But if you're going to do IVF, you should get as many eggs as you can. Um, egg quality is predetermined. The idea that a pill or a shot makes a big difference is actually nonsense. And the best data for that is from cycles of natural cycle IVF, where you get almost no medication or actually no medication. And in those studies, they've demonstrated that there's no difference in the outcome with the stimulated cycles, even including genetics. Uh, that was just about four or five months ago, there was a study that compared natural cycle IVF to stimulated IVF and showed that the euploidy of the embryos, meaning the number that were genetically normal, was no different between the two groups. So there's absolutely no reason to believe that Clomid is better or that the shots mess up your egg quality. That's just not true. Get a better doctor. Sorry. Uh, loved how much hope and compassion you gave to your patients when I shadowed you. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet of you. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Uh, I do love my patients. Um, I am taking, and I love my family who puts up with all the time I spend with my patients. I love you, honey, and kids. Uh, I am taking a fertility supplement that has 1,360 micrograms of DFE. Can I add five milligrams of folic acid to it? Uh, that's a Gen Strong question, but it should be fine. Although um, there are studies that show when your folic acid levels uh, go too high, um, that you actually increase the risk of autism. Now it has to be quite high, but the risk of autism increases 17 fold. So I wouldn't overdo it. Um, if you're taking DFE, you don't necessarily need to take a ton of folic acid, so I would be cautious with that one. Um, good question. Are you more likely to have success with donor-adopted embryos than with your own embryos with unexplained infertility? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, no. In fact, if anything, you should have higher success with your own, but it, again, depends on what's causing the unexplained infertility. Um, so there are some cases where we have to go to donor egg, donor sperm, or donor uh, embryo. They're pretty fairly rare. Usually we are able to succeed. And before I would start looking at getting donor embryos, I'd actually look at taking your embryos and putting them into a family member or a friend or whatever, or a surrogate um, to try and get them pregnant so that you can use your own genetics, just have somebody else carry it. Uh, not necessarily cheap, but reasonable. Okay. Hi, Dr. Victory. What is a good DNA fragmentation result? Do you have a cutoff when not to do IVF and try to improve the results? Yeah. Uh, great question. Thanks for asking that, Jess. So uh, our the standard cutoff for the uh, DFI, the um, DNA fragmentation index, is 15%. And if you're below 25%, you're really not doing well at all. 15% um, is the cutoff for good. Um, and then it's kind of like fair and then poor when you have more than 25%. So you definitely want a higher DNA uh, frag than 25% um, than and ideally higher than 15 uh, If you're looking at some of the other scores, there's an HDS score, there's a DDS score. Um, those are different, and uh, they have different metrics, but most people look at the DFI. And so certainly if you have a really high DFI, um, as I mentioned, we use Zymo both for our, our IVF and for our IUI cycles um, to try and uh, get rid of the sperm with the high DNA fragmentation. 
but it is well worth it to spend some time if your partner is doing stuff that's contributing to the DNA fragmentation to eliminate that. Smoking, drinking, drug use, the high cholesterol, the high sugar, obesity, um, anything causing inflammation, exposures, chemical exposures, work or environmental exposures, all those are super important. So um, make sure that you, uh, that you check that out as well. Uh, thank you for answering my question. You are awesome. Well, thank you. You guys are awesome for watching. Thanks for watching. I appreciate that from everybody. We love having you guys here. How early should you start taking clomidor letrozole before IUI? Not sure what the question means, but uh, clomidor letrozole should be done day three to seven, and then your IUI when you're ovulating, if that's what you're asking. If you mean how many cycles of clomidor letrozole should you do alone before adding in IUI, it depends on your diagnosis. Um, and how quickly you want to get pregnant. So it's all about the success rates. Hello, hello. how often do you do surgery for blocked tubes? Uh, do you mean putting tubes back together that were intentionally blocked or from uh, blockage from something like chlamydia gonorrhea? So if it's chlamydia gonorrhea blockage, rarely because it's super, super hard to fix those tubes. I have done it, I'm good at doing it, but it never works. Um, the tube just ends up getting stuck back together again. If you mean putting the tubes back together after you've had a clip placed on them or they were uh, split for some reason because you had thought you didn't want children and now you do, I do that all the time, um, at least uh, one every six weeks or so, uh, sometimes more, two every six weeks. And actually right now we have a whole lineup of people we're just uh, arranging to do it in a center in Toronto. So we'll be doing that shortly. Uh, you and Dr. P, that's my colleague, Dr. Padson, have told me I'm perimenopausal and this is the first time my body has skipped my cycle. So I've ovulated twice this month. Do you think our chances trying on our own could increase? This is the first time my body has skipped my cycle. So I've ovulated twice this month. If you've skipped your cycle, you actually haven't ovulated. So I'm not sure you're reading that the right way. Uh, maybe get back in touch with us so we can check things. But no, it, you, you can't biologically ovulate twice. So if you've skipped a cycle, you haven't ovulated even once, let alone twice. So you might be confused on that one. How much is a surrogacy approximately? I had to get a hysterectomy due to uterine cancer. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have a surrogate already, had three miscarriages. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, uh, that requires extensive investigation of you and your surrogate. Um, my experience, and we do a lot of surrogacy and a lot of donor cycles, is it can be anywhere from relatively reasonable, which is like thirty, forty thousand dollars, all the way up to eighty, and if you're going to the U.S., hun literally hundreds, like one hundred fifty thousand to get a U.S. surrogate, which is insane. So it can be pricey, it can be reasonable, depends on where you're getting the surrogate from, who they are. And sometimes it can be quite inexpensive. I just had a mom be a surrogate for her daughter. Uh, and uh, those folks are amazing and they had a great journey and a good outcome. So uh, it doesn't have to cost a fortune. Okay, uh, one or two last questions real quick. Do you have any update doing laparoscopy at your clinic? Uh, just put in the call today, so I'll have updates maybe by next time if the guy gets back to me. What other diagnoses are there besides unexplained for irregular no periods? That's not unexplained. That's almost PCOS, almost always PCOS, or a hormonal problem like your thyroid's not working properly, or possibly uh, that there is a thyroid dysfunction. That's um, something that can happen. It could be uh, cortisol levels. It could be stress. Um, it can be a million different things. But if you're having uh, no period, the only other possibility is you're becoming menopausal. How often do you speak or see your patients? As often as they need me to, I guess. So we talk to you once initially. We talk to you again when we get all your results. And often I'll see you for an ultrasound in between there. Uh, and then beyond that, it's as often as you want. So some people want to talk to me more often. Other people just want to try things a few times. So we kind of leave that up to you to decide what you need. And I think we're done. Okay, guys, um, don't hesitate to ask your other questions on some of the other formats. Um, and uh, we'll be back in touch with you soon. Um, 
thank you for joining us. Appreciate you guys all being here. We uh, look forward to next week. I'll find hopefully another good topic to review with you guys, and we'll uh, see if we can uh, get some more people to do the right thing. Take care. Have a great night, and thanks for watching. Bye.